Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. A lot of you folks this evening have... My name is Charles... And I'm an alcoholic. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Bella told me if if anybody ever tells you when they get before a crowd of people to talk, they tell you they ain't nervous, you watch them. They'll lie about other things, too. One fellow told me I looked like a New York pimp tonight. <laughs> and, uh, I thought that was a compliment. <laughs> There's so many things that folks told me when I first came around AA that uh, was really derogatory that I thanked them for. Cause, see, where I came from uh, was was way down the ladder. I, I mean... I had, you know, folks have different lengths of ladders. Some folks have a real tall ladder. Runs way up into the ethereal. I mean, us, just us common folks look up, we can't tell what they're doing. The children are all going to school, got books and shoes and bicycles, and when they get up a little bit, they get automobiles and we don't know what whether they're doing right or wrong. And then there's other fellow middle class folks, you know, the taxpayers. <laughs> they, they got little shorter ladders than than those real uppity folks. And and then there's folks that they got pretty short, real short ladders. Uh, they're the kind of folks that the dog growls when they come home and and uh they don't bring home their pay and and spend a lot of time in jail. And in fact, they feel more home in jail than they do at home. And, and those kind of folks. And then there was me. <laughs> and, and I had the shortest little ladder you ever seen, and it was sitting in a hole. <laughs> And I had to come up before I could reach level. But when I wound up in AA, I I was brought to AA. I, when you get down as low as I went, you don't go nowhere. You either brought or sent. <laughs> and well, well, actually, when AA contacted me, I was one of the first people that AA in Little Rock, Arkansas contacted when they first started. And I was in a state hospital for nervous diseases. <laughs> that was the local nut house. And they, they, these, uh, this fellow, this fellow wore the white coat. Somebody knocked on the door, and and there wasn't any doorknob on my side. I couldn't let him in. <laughs> and he told me that that I had company, and, and they was waiting in the day room. And if you ever seen one in nut house day rooms, they're not too inviting. It as a matter of fact that they wasn't acceptable at all. I thought. Uh, but let's don't dwell on that. But anyway, I got out to the day room, and here's two fellers. I never had seen them before, and they said that they represented a bunch of people. They called themselves a fellowship, and and they uh, had heard that I was a likely prospect. <laughs> And uh, they said that my mother had told them that 
she believed I was worth saving. And I said, I think I am too. And they kept telling me about a fellow named Bill Wilson and a doctor named Bob Smith. And that this name of this fellowship was Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, well, I can't think of two better names for fellows that started this outfit than Smith and Wilson, because you open your telephone book and there's page after page of Wilson, and you go over to the Smiths and there's page after page of, of Smiths. So the good Lord certainly picked two appropriate people. And they kept on talking about it, and I wasn't paying too much attention. But then they said something that caught my attention. They said, if you will join us, we will help you get out of here. (laughs) I perked up, and I listened. And I nodded. <laughs> and I said, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> And I said, I'd join. Uh, uh, if, if you'd let me join on credit, I didn't have any money. <laughs> and uh, it seemed that that was possible. And uh, everything just looked fine, and, and they left. And sure enough, the next day, I was taken downstairs and introduced to a board of psychiatry. And there was five of them. And they were sitting at one of these rectangular tables that that they have around these AA meetings. You folks that are standing up back there, there's two empty seats right here staring me in the face. Uh, got any more around here? There's another one right here in first row. If you don't want to hear me, don't come up here. Cause <laughs> There's two more right here. Right here. I didn't forget what I was talking about. It just don't make no difference. <laughs> Because when you go home tonight and go to a meeting, uh, folks will say, did you go out there to Charlie's anniversary? You'll say, yes. And they'll say, uh, uh, what did they talk about? And you'll say, damn fine, though. <laughs> I never was able to tie a talk together. <laughs> and And when I got home, well, I thought of the most wonderful things to say, just <laughs> things that would really enlighten people. But uh, it won't happen tonight, so. <laughs> don't, uh, uh, anyway, these psychiatrists were sitting there, one here and one there and one down at the end of the table, one over here and one over here, and I'm sitting down here waiting for them to start their questions. And nothing happened. And this one that sat over here was looking through me. I don't know if you ever had anybody focus through you or not, but he had me looking behind me. (laughs) And there wasn't anything there. But he kept focusing through me, and I knew he wasn't looking at me, so I just discarded him. I said, well, one out of five, that ain't bad. The next one was a woman that had a head of hair that looked like a bed that never had been made up. And she kept doing this. And I thought, just shoving that around on your head ain't going to help. (laughs) 
you're going to have to go someplace, and they're going to have to do something to that. <laughs> but she kept doing that, and after a while, it lost its amusing power. And, and uh, I looked at the fellow down at the end. <coughs> and he was right entertaining. I enjoyed him because he had a shoulder kept going away from him. And that shoulder would, would go up and, and, and he'd see where it went. <laughs> and, and that was fun watching him. And, and you never knew when it was going to happen. And that was part of the entertainment. I mean, it just, then all of a sudden, you know, it had happened. It, it had to go. <laughs> and the next fella, the one sitting right next to him, was taking notes. Not on me, on them. <laughs> He was watching those other fellas. And, and the last one, one sitting over here, I looked in his eyes and there wasn't anybody home. <laughs> and I kept looking back to see if anybody had moved in. <laughs> and I thought to myself, them nuts up on the third floor where I was could have straightened these folks out, I believe. Could have helped them a lot. And I said, the first time I've had the opportunity, I believe I'll do the best I can. And I really thought I was going to be able to help them. Because they are my first patients. And... So they started asking questions, and they never gave me a chance to answer. When, when I'd say, oh, uh, then another one would ask me a question, and then another one, and finally I never did get to answer a question, and finally I thought, well, they're just hoo-rawing me, and I've had a plenty of that. So I said, oh, to hell with this, and that is the answer. <laughs> and they let me go the next day. <laughs> and, of course, I got drunk on the way home to celebrate getting out, which was normal for an alcoholic. And when I got off of the bus and started up the hill towards our house, I could see my mother sitting on the swing. One of these uh, swings that, that got chains on each end and, and there's room enough for two people on them and she loved to sit out there on that swing because she could see who was ever coming down the road. And she saw me and, and she knew I was drinking. I, I wasn't knee walking drink, drunk. I, I, I wasn't snot slinging, just, you know, just, just pleasantly drunk, you know, just, and she could smell whiskey over the phone. <laughs> oh, she, she knew I was drinking, and when she saw me, she came down off of the porch and met me on the walk. And she was crying. And she said, Son, you're a wanted child, and I've always loved you, and I still love you. But I want you to leave home and not ever come back until such time as you can conduct yourself as a man. And so help me God, I didn't know how a man was supposed to conduct himself. Uh, my father had left my mother and I when I was eight months old, and my mother did the best 
she could. In fact, she did better than was possible, I thought. She worked in a bindery in a printing office, and she didn't make but $17.50 a week, and she had to pay part of that to somebody to take care of me, or she would leave me in the orphanage in the daytime. And I'm not blaming that on my alcoholism. I I don't think that I was underly fathered or uh, had trouble with my toity training. I don't. I think that alcoholism is a disease, and I think that it has to do with your metabolism. And I think that we are no more guilty of being. Uh, bad people than somebody that breaks out when they eat watermelon or grapes. As a lot of people do. A lot of people are allergic to some different kinds of food. And I've never met anybody that really knows why we're alcoholic. But I do know this, that if you take a hundred people and give them all they want to drink for a month, at the end of that month, you'll have ten alcoholics. One out of ten. Because nine out of ten people can drink with impunity. I never could drink with impunity or, or anybody else. <laughs> But you take somebody, a uh, hundred people, and give them narcotics all they want for a month, and you're going to wind up with a hundred narcotics. Now, these uh, treatment centers that tell you a drug is a drug is a drug, there's something wrong with that statement. Because we all know, everybody sitting here knows that there are nine out of ten people that can drink alcohol in any amount they choose and take care of their business, raise a family, and be considered good citizens. We alcoholics can't do that. And it don't make any difference if you've been sober a year, or 10 years, or 30 years, or 50 years, or if you never had a drink. If you are an alcoholic, you cannot drink alcohol socially. You'll do things that you don't want to do. Now, I'd like to clarify that a little. <coughs> Excuse me. Everybody <coughs> has a set of rules. Everybody. I'm not talking about the laws of the land or the edicts of the church. I'm talking about your own specific set of rules that you yourself have created to govern your behavior. This is your set of rules, and everybody's got a set of rules. But while you're drinking, you break your own rules. Then there's something wrong. And it just could be that the thing that's wrong is you are an alcoholic. I was one of those people. People would tell me things that I had done, and I'd say, oh, no, I couldn't have done that. They'd say, you, you ought to apologize to old Fred. Old Fred is a good friend of yours, and the way you talked to him last night, you certainly owe him an apology. 
and I didn't even remember seeing Fred the night before. And AA taught me that that was a blackout. Well, we've all heard these expressions, and we all have made mistakes that we didn't believe we were capable of making. And if you want perfect serenity, forgive everybody in the world for their next mistake. And when they make their next mistake, you've already forgiven them for it, so it's not going to upset your serenity. Just forgive them for the next mistake they make. You think you can do that? The book says no. Because if you could do that, you'd be a saint. Saint Charles. <laughs> no, I never learned to do that. You know, we stay sober in uh, uh, spots, uh, levels. Uh, some people stay sober easier than other people. Some people have a hard time staying sober. Some people don't get drunk in the first place. My mother had 77 years and nobody ever baked her a cake. <laughs> but uh, getting back to that level or plateaus we get sober in plateaus we first we get sober physically that don't take long as a matter of fact no matter how long you've been drunk you after five six days you'll be eaten and if you're in some kind of joint you'll be stealing the guy next to you's hard-boiled egg your appetite will come back. You'll start wanting to walk around wherever you are. Get a little exercise. And the next phase is you get mentally sober. That takes a lot longer. You get sober mentally and when you're sober mentally, uh, you can remember what you went in the next room for. <laughs> I haven't reached that stage yet. I still go in the next room, forgot what I went after. They, they tell me that's old age, but I, I'm only 83. And that, in my life, that's just the spring of the years. Because I plan to live 140 years. <laughs> and then see how things are going, and maybe I'll stick around a while longer. But anyway, that's the third plateau. And the next plateau is spirituality. You get sober spiritually and you start praying sincerely you start, start meaning what you pray for and you begin to realize that every prayer you ever prayed is answered by your God the God of your understanding sometimes the answer is no you're not ready for whatever you ask for. And I, I used to ask for a merry-go-round when I was in with the carnival. And all the time I needed a Ferris wheel. <laughs> anyway, I never got either one. I got a, a penny pitch 
and I got a geek show. If I was young enough, I'd make another season with my geek show. <laughs> and there, there's plenty of geeks. <laughs> but people want to get in show business just tell them that you need a geek. I'll go. I've had lots of geeks. We never did any glomming. That when when you say glomming, that means when you bite chickens' heads off, uh, uh, kill lizards with your mouth, and and uh, uh, eat mice. Hell, I never had any of those things because they cost money. I had plenty of guys that would do it, but uh, I just never thought that was necessary. You see, what I had, I had a a Frank Buck outfit, and I had one of them pith hats, that's P-I-T-H, pith, pith hat. And and, uh, I had on the Sam Belt. Uh, Sam Brown belt and a big 45 with pearl handle, nickel plated, full of blanks, strapped on my side and had them boots, them black boots that come up just below the knee. And I'd go to a local slaughterhouse and, and get, uh, a bone. I'd get the bloodiest, biggest, with a lot of sinews hanging from it, you know, and get a pitchfork and stick on there so it'd stick, throw that over my shoulder and go down the midway hollering, we're going to feed her now. We're going to feed her now. And, and everybody would follow me. They would... They, they wouldn't let me have but two shows a day, and because I I'd clear the midway. Just everybody had followed me down, and I had two ticket sellers, and I I had two of these big megaphones, uh, and I had two kids that would pull on a rope with rosin on it, and the other end of these rope was tied into a five-gallon lard bucket, and they had on gloves that would cause this thing to make a sound like, you know, like some animal that was in mortal battle or something. And, 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 keep, and that, that uh, sound, of course, was magnified and... and uh, uh, people would be buying tickets 50 cents a piece, and that was a lot of money in those days, 50 cents a piece for those tickets, and they'd just buy those tickets, and inside I had a fella with some brown grease paint on him, and long hair, he looked like a, a Princeton sophomore <laughs> now. Or some of these fellas you see running around the street. Uh, and he had tusks, had false tusks that was too long, you know, and, and he'd jump up once in a while and, and, uh, just jump up and like that, you know. And then, then these two groaners was going, and, and this other kid would be pulling on his and, and, and uh, I'd, I'd walk, I had this catwalk and going across the pit. The pit is a, some four by, two by fours with a bed sheet or old dirty piece of canvas down it. And he was down in there and, and, and I'd get all excited walking across this catwalk. It'd be a, a two by ten and, and I'd look like I, I, I was really afraid that he's going to get out of there. Down, down, down! And, and, and grabbed that 45. Whack, 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 whack! And, and every, 
everybody that had paid to get in there would see that the show was me. <laughs> that this guy that was the geek wasn't doing the damn thing. He's, he's just sitting down there out of the way. And once in a while he'd jump up like that. And that was the show. And uh, I'd get sloughed once in a while and explain to the uh, chief of police or the sergeant or judge, whoever I went before, that I, I wasn't doing anything that was illegal, that I, all I had was a big sign that said EVA, E-V-A. And all I said was, we going to feed her now. <laughs> and if that fellow wanted to eat that old bone, with all that sin on it, that was his problem, not mine. <laughs> so before it was over with, why well, whoever arrested me and whoever he took me to, we'd laugh and they'd forget it. And and that that was what I just got through saying. If I was strong enough, I believe I'd like to make another season doing that. <laughs> I really would. I forget what brought that on. <laughs> and I'm sure you did too. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, being an alcoholic is, in my humble estimation, a real privilege. Where else, who else in the whole world can go anywhere in the world and find a group of people that they can talk to, eyeball to eyeball? Can't do that in any lodge that I know of. Can't do it in the Knights of Columbus. Can't do it in the Masons. They're the two biggest. And the eagles, the elks, and moose, they ain't going to quit playing cards long enough to mess with you. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, all you got to do is stick around, and a guy like me can have an anniversary and get this whole room full of people. Whole room. All sober. There's only one guy with his hat on back there, and somebody just never has told him that he forgot to take that hat off. <laughs> and he, he's looking around now, and, and he don't see anybody else with a hat on, and he realizes that he's in one of God's houses. And this is where a lot of us found God. The church failed, but AA didn't fail us. We found God here, and we learned how to pray, a prayer that's for individuals, individuals. You can take that hat off now without being embarrassed. I know you got some hair because you got some hanging out. <laughs> but anyway... When, when I was brought to AA, I, I hung around, and it was in 1940, and in 1940, there wasn't but five groups in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Houston, Texas, vie for that honor because they both started about the same time. So there wasn't but five other groups in the world. And everybody in it was sincere. And they had a, a deal whereby you stayed in AA. You stayed in the dormitory. And they told you that if you were 
ready to quit drinking, it had to be important to enough to you for you to stick around and learn what it was all about. And folks would say, I got a family at home. And they said, you had a family at home when you was drunk. When you didn't go home because you was drunk. When you didn't go home because you couldn't get there because you was in jail. They said, if you want to go home, go on home and come back here when you want to get sober. That was part of the Little Rock plan. Well, it didn't make no difference to me because... They didn't want me at home anyhow. I ought to tell you now about the time I committed suicide. <laughs> well, I didn't succeed, but i got gotten to the point where I thought my family wasn't doing me right. And I would would go home, and, and they wouldn't let me carry a key to the front door. I had to knock to get in my own house. And it would go something like I'd knock on the door, and the door would open just a tad, just a little teeny bit. And some member of my family would say, Yeah. And I'd say, What do you mean, yes? Open the door. I live here. Yes, but you're drunk. Well, of course I'm drunk. If I ain't drunk, I wasted a lot of money on whiskey. Now, let me in. And I'd go barging through the house and get back to my little appointed room, open the door, go in and slam the door and sit on the side of the bed and cry. Because I wanted more than anything in the world to be with my family. I wanted to put my arm, my arms, plural, around my mother and tell her that I wasn't going to embarrass my family again. Never. But I couldn't do that. I had done that too many times. So I would stay in the room, and I knew if any other member of the family got a hold of me, I knew what what they'd say. Why do you do this, Charles? Why do you embarrass us to this extent? Why do you do the things that that you do? See, I got my name in the paper under North Little Rock column. Charles Lindenwood was arrested again. Got 30 days this time. Ah, oh, they put a little heart on it. You know, like, <laughs> like that ought to be entertaining. And it did get to the point where I felt more at home on the county farm. They wouldn't let me work on a chain gang no more. Because one time they put me on the dog catcher's wagon, and I love dogs, and they love me. Sort of an intellectual level. <laughs> and I had, I had a, a truck full of dogs before you could say scat. I, I, dog, I said, good, good. Let me come in. Jump up and I'd hold him. He'd lick my face and I'd say, we're going for a ride. <laughs> and I'd put him in the wagon. We finally got so many couldn't hold anymore and went out to the pound and there was this great big steel cage. Looked like some circus had gone broke and they got the iron, the one that kept the lines in during the performance. Big round thing. Well, they put all the dogs in there, and I went in with them. Gave them some water and petted them and made friends with the ones I hadn't caught. And this dog catcher that was in charge of me and the dogs and the truck that he was driving said, I've got to go to the other part of the pound for something or other, and he oughtn't have done it. 
You were ahead of me, ain't you? You know what I did. Well, I did it. I turned all the dogs loose. <coughs> I opened that door to that cage and yeah, go, go. And they all ran off except one little lady dog that just stayed there and she, she fell in love with me. Yeah. And when he got back, there was me and this little lady dog. He said, what have you done? He turned red, green, pink. He had the quivers. What, what is that? He had an, an attack. They, they say that in these, these, uh, treatment centers that, what is that, Liz? That, that, that he had an anxiety attack. <laughs> They they give pills now for anxiety. What the hell is anxiety? <laughs> I, tra- I heard that about two years ago from a fellow, and I figured, well, anxiety must be like when I was afraid to step off the curb or afraid to get on a bus or a streetcar, afraid to walk down the block because I see a cop down there. I thought of anxiety as be something when you had to shake so bad and, and you started to sit down and you got back up because you didn't know if you could sit down or not. And, and I thought that's what it was. But ang- I, I never have really figured out what an anxiety attack was. But anyway, he had whatever it is. <laughs> and he, uh, that, that's when they stopped letting me be on the, the town trucks, the garbage trucks and the, whoo, the garbage trucks. When you got a hangover and they put you on a garbage truck, you add to the load. <laughs> and, well, anyway, uh, uh, they, they took me out to the, County farm the next morning, and they uh, uh, was gonna hold corn. I don't know if you ever hold corn or not, but when corn is, in those days they don't do that anymore. They plant it like grass now, but uh, in those days they planted just three little kernels to a hill, and you had to hold every one of those hills. And, and sometimes they put a little fertilizer in with each hill, but the, the corn was a big deal in those days. And this captain, Captain Todd Hunter was his name, and Captain Todd Hunter said, This is sweet. I thought, well. He said, Today we, we gonna hold corn, and I want you to leave three to a hill. And I thought, good Lord. And we had great big heavy holes. You just, when you got used to it, it, it just sort of did it by itself. You, you get that movement, I believe I've got it. Hey, look at that. And, well, we went to the two place and, and Got, got holes, and I got a hole, and they gave me a roll to hold, and, and I was in business. But I never had hold any corn. And the other fellows started out, and I, I went too, and I was leaving three or something. <clears throat> and it wasn't but just a few minutes till here come the captain up, this row behind me, and I thought he'd seen my way of doing things and saw that I was destined for finer things. And he was on this great, big, beautiful black horse. And he said, Son? He always called me son. I called him son, too. (laughs) 
very quietly. Uh, he said, Son, you don't know much about farming, do you? I said, No, sir. No, sir. I, I figured he was going to put me in the office where I belong. And he said, Get down. I said, Get down? He said, Yeah, just lay down there on the ground on your stomach, preferably. And I began to suspicion something. <laughs> and he had a big belt fastened to that horse, about that wide and about that long, and had a wooden handle on it, about like that. And he'd do unfurled it like that, and and put his foot on it so it would curl up on the end like that. And then he laid that on me. Wow! You could have heard me holler clear into town. Because I wasn't going to make him think I wasn't hurting. <laughs> and he, he just hit me three times. And you know, when I got up from there, I could tell corn from Johnson Gray. <laughs> this as far as I could see it. And he taught me all about farming with that same little educational implement. He taught me how to catch castrate pigs. Taught me how to keep potatoes from freezing in the winter time. He taught me things that I never knew existed. But then come the time when plowing season in the spring come. And it was way full daylight and somebody awakened me and said, hey, Charlie, get up. You're on the plow squad. And I said, I don't know anything about plowing. He said, we'll teach you. <laughs> and I, I, I tightened up like a bull in fly time. And I went out there and we went out in, in the lot where they keep the mules. And they appointed two big, tall, blue-nosed Arkansas mule to me as my own special plow mule. And I couldn't get that bridle on those mules. I couldn't even reach the ears. So a couple of the, the pecker woods finally showed me how to put that bridle on them. And we went out, and here come the captain, and giving us our instructions. And, and he said, boys, I want you to give me straight furs now. And everybody agreed that was a good idea, and me and Bruce and Eagle, that was the, hard, the mule's name, me and Bruce and Eagle's went out across that field and left a fur looked like a nervous snake. <laughs> and here come the captain on that great, big, beautiful black horse. And he said, look like I'm going to have to teach you to plow, don't it, son? I said, do you? <laughs> well, he said, get down, and I got down, and he, he gave me three, and you know, I got up from there, and old Bruce was standing there with them two front legs crossed. <laughs> and just at ease. And, and the other mule was standing there, and he'd allowed his ears to relax. Half asleep. And I said, well, boys, the captain done got through to me. 
<laughs> Looked like I'm going to have to get through to y'all. So I walked down the turn row and, and got a limb that had fallen off a tree about the size of a two by two and hit both them mules right between the ears. Whack! They come to attention. And I mean, we went up across that field and you could have put a transit on that. Just straight. Now, I don't know why it is that us drunks don't want to do anything the way it's explained to us. We have to have a different kind of explanation. We have to have things shown to us in a different manner. But I'm telling you that, that everything that that captain taught me to do, I remember. I could still plow. And those mules were my mules. And I used to take them out if I was hauling logs or, or getting dirt out of dishes and no matter what. Those mules, I, I didn't have to catch them from the mule yard. They'd come when I'd say, Bruce, eagle, let's go, boy. They come up and nuzzle me. Mule got the softest nuzzle, and, and if you ever have to work with mules, you just fall in love with them. You, you really appreciate them. And I, I could load logs onto a wagon with those mules when other mules wouldn't even pull the logs up there. And I'd just walk out in front of them and say, Come on now, boys. Come on. Lean into it. And those mules would lean into that harness, and that log would roll right on up on that wagon. And I used to steal for them. I'd steal a little sugar and a little salt. Mules love salt. I used to steal a head of lettuce or cabbage, get some sweet grass for them, and and I I went down to Arkansas to talk at their convention one time, and they took me out to this county farm, and there was two mules out there, and I swear it must have been Bruce and Eagle. Because when they saw me, they come over there and nuzzle me. But it couldn't have been because it was 30 years later and mules just don't live that long. But I'll bet Bruce and Eagle are living in heaven. I know some of you got dogs that you know is in heaven. I'm, I believe in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe in every one of you people here. I know that everybody here is one of God's children. And I know that God loves you. And God wants for you the best. I know that. But I know there was a time when you felt that God didn't love you anymore. That God didn't care. I know that because I've talked to a lot of alcoholics that felt that there was a God, but God was mad at them. And I felt that way. I felt that God was angry with me and he was justified in his anger because I had broken his laws and the laws of man. And I didn't know how not to break the laws because I justified my actions by saying God wants me to keep body and soul together and I'm going to do it in whatever fashion I can. Maybe we have to do that sometime. Maybe we have to do what's wrong 
to keep body and soul together. I don't know. But I, I remember people talking to me about things that I should and should not do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I hated them. I hated these wonderful people that, that was telling me what I needed to hear. I didn't want to listen to that. I wanted a pat on the back for nothing. I didn't have anything to give. I didn't know what I was supposed to do, what I was supposed to give. And these people were taking their time to tell me what was expected of me and how to do it. And I wouldn't listen. I remember a guy named Doug Halley, one of the original members of AA, and he used to call me over. And I would walk over, and he would say something like, Boy, you're double dumb. <laughs> and I would say, How can you be double dumb? He said, you are ignorant of the fact that you are ignorant. <laughs> and I was. Doug never told me a lie, but it took me a long time to find out that he was telling me the truth. I remember one time I was talking to some new people that had just come in AA. There was three of them. And I was telling them, boy, be like me. Get your job. I had a job washing dishes in a Greek restaurant. When you get fired from washing dishes in a Greek restaurant, you're unemployable. <laughs> and I got fired from washing dishes in a Greek restaurant. I said, get your room. I had a $3 a week wall, hall room with a chair painted on the wall. <laughs> there wasn't room for furniture. I said, don't be sleeping in doorways and in these flop houses. You get lousy. Get you a nice room. I'll show you mine. I'd take people up there and show them. Open the door. We couldn't go in there because there wasn't room for two people. I said, look at there. Had an old hospital bed about that high. They quit using them in hospitals because people fall out of them and kill themselves. They had to move down a little bit. But I really thought I was on that upward road. I really thought that. And people like Doug Halley and several more that would take time to tell me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear, saved my life. Because after a while, it became necessary for me to look into my rear view mirror. And when I looked into my rear view mirror and saw from whence I came, I saw what Doug Halley was talking about. And I saw what those other old timers were talking about. They're all dead now, but God knows I love the memory of these people. Well, I'm going to quit now because there's some things that need to be done and want to be done. But if there's a thrill left in me, I'm having it right now. Looking into your faces and being here and knowing that most of you are here because it's my anniversary and Elfrida's anniversary. God bless you all. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.